Thanks everybody for sticking it out to the end. Um, we've got a great symposium. Um, I, I will tell you that this is going to be a biased symposium um, because the you know I, the, the question we're posing is you know to a number of people who've been very successful um, in, in making global orthopedics a thing, making it part of their careers. And um, so just take that with a grain of salt. You're probably not, you know, we're not going to have the same kind of debate we had earlier this morning, um, point counterpoint. Um, I, I think you're going to hear a number of people really eloquently describe the importance of global orthopedics, um, uh, how uh, UCSF um, has, has really um, taken, yeah, taken this, uh, this mission on and how um, we've, you know, continued to leverage partnerships um, both locally and globally to, to, to have an impact. So um, we're going to start with, uh, with my partner, David Shearer, um, who's going to talk uh, to us about the global burden um, and UCSF's response. David. Great. Uh, thanks, Sam. Um, <clears throat> so um, spoiler alert, the answer is not futility. Um, so <clears throat> let's jump into this here. I don't have any relevant disclosures for this talk. Um, I'm just going to be talking a little bit about the global burden. I think uh, everyone at UCSF is pretty familiar with a lot of these issues, but I'm still going to give a, a little bit of a highlight on that. We'll talk about some of our uh, current programs here at UCSF and uh, just a little bit on and highlight some of what's been new over the last year um, that we've been doing. So, you know, if to boil it down into a nutshell, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the incidence of musculoskeletal disease in many forms, trauma and non-traumatic musculoskeletal disease, is a lot higher in um, low and middle income settings, lower resource settings, and the resources to treat it is a lot lower, and that leads to a very large unmet burden of disease. Um, and if you've traveled, you know, abroad at all in a lower resource place, you've probably experienced roads like this, um, and it's no surprise that uh, musculoskeletal injury uh, is a big problem. Um, <clears throat> figures like this, uh, there are a lot of variations on this, but the, the commonly quoted statistic uh, is that injury ha causes more deaths than malaria, TB, uh, and HIV AIDS combined. Um, and it's really kind of the tip of the iceberg. So um, that's, it's very easy to measure road traffic fatalities as a, as a statistic. It's a lot harder to measure orthopedic disability, which may make it to a hospital, may not make it to a hospital. So it's sort of the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, to be talking about mortality only. It's estimated that there are 1.2 million traffic fatalities um, and 20 to 50 million are disabled due to road traffic injury uh, every year. Um, and the incidence of disability from road traffic injury is about two to five times higher in low and middle income countries. But I, what I wanted to emphasize in this, because I think everybody's heard about how trauma is a problem, was to emphasize that this is not just a trauma problem. So, um, you know, you can look, and I think pediatrics and trauma have historically been two of the subspecialties that have been very involved in global engagement, and there's a, lo a lot of uh, work out there about the burden of pediatric disease. But there's also an increasing incidence of osteoarthritis, something that touches, uh, obviously, arthroplasty, but pr practically all the subspecialties of orthopedics. It turns out that one in six people in low- and middle-income countries has osteoarthritis. Uh, we can look at hand injuries and their prevalence, with, and, um, which is a massive unmet burden. Um, spine also uh, can be included. Both degenerative and traumatic spine injuries uh, have a very high prevalence in lower- and middle-income countries that is more than double uh, what is seen in high-income countries. Um, and for the sports stocks that are still in the room, uh, that's important too. And you know, this study actually showed that like there's 30 million adolescents in Africa that have bad sports injuries, um, and there are not a lot of arthroscopy sets out there to treat them. So um, my point in this is just to bring up that you know I think a lot of us know about the burden of traumatic injury, but it extends really across all of the orthopedic um, specialties. And um, there are many ways I could express how, uh, how little resources there is to, to treat it, but this is probably one of the more compelling ways is just to talk about how many surgeons there are. Uh, in the United States, we have about 75 orthopedists per million people. In Ghana, there's less than one per million people. So for per surgeon, there's more than a million people that they have to treat. And then their training programs are training at a third less the rate per population. And so they're not catching up uh, very quickly. So, the take home message is a really high incidence of uh, musculoskeletal problems and uh, far fewer resources to treat it. 
So I think everyone's pretty uh, familiar with um, I got in this room. Um, for those that aren't, um, it's the Institute for Global Orthopedics and Traumatology. Um, it was founded here more than 15 years ago now as a nonprofit departmental initiative. And our focus is not on going and doing surgery ourselves. Our focus is on partnering with surgeons in low middle income countries to help support them uh, in whatever way they need, predominantly through research and education. Um, this is just an uh, outline of our places where we have active partnerships uh, ongoing currently. Um, this is sort of the current uh, uh, leadership team of IGOT, um, uh, but really it's all many faculty here at UCSF that are engaged in IGOT in various ways. One kind of newer development is that we've uh, got an advisory board, um, uh, that, which is led by Dave Atkin, who you'll be hearing from shortly, um, but both a North American and an international board who provide us with input and strategic uh, uh, advice on how uh, we can strengthen our programs. As I mentioned, our pillars are uh, research, uh, education research, uh, and then leadership. Um, and as many of you know, uh, one of the pillars of our, uh, key parts of our educational pillar is uh, our global rotation for residents um, around the world. And um, it's very exciting that uh, over, the, over the last year, the program's up and going again. Uh, Jen O'Donnell just got back from uh, Tanzania. So we've had a couple of residents in Tanzania and a couple of residents in Ghana so far post COVID. So things are starting to feel a little bit uh, back to normal. And this, the enthusiasm that comes from this program, I think is what drives, has over the years driven a lot of uh, IGOT's uh, programs. So very excited to have this uh, up and running again. Um, one, one thing to mention is that we've made a commitment to our partner sites that for every one of our residents that goes abroad, we will host a resident uh, here at uh, UCSF in a truly reciprocal exchange. Uh, uh, Sanjeev's gonna talk a bit more about bidirectionality, but this is just something that's really uh, at the core of our ethos and I think a really important step forward for us with this program. Um, and here you go, we do have this observership program. We haven't been able to make it truly reciprocal where they're able to do all the same things that we can do in terms of scrubbing in and being as engaged, but we're, we're really trying to do everything we can to, to reciprocate uh, with our partners. Uh, the SMART course, I think people are familiar with. This is our short course uh, that we do uh, both here in the United States and internationally. Um, it's our short courses that are most primarily focused on open fracture teaching, but really have evolved to cover the breadth of orthopedic subspecialties. Um, and uh, the kind of exciting news for this one is we're finally going international again uh, in just a few weeks, uh, doing our Tanzania Smart course uh, at the beginning of June. So kind of a, an exciting uh, step after COVID. And it was kind of fun this year, you know, we usually get about 150 participants from around Africa and we put the registration out this year and there were like 180 and we had to like stop it, you know, <laughs> within a few days. So there was a lot of pent up demand for uh, this type of education, which is exciting. So uh, we're really, uh, really excited about this. Um, there were some references to the IGOT portal and uh, Dr. Vail's uh, State of the Department address. Uh, this continues to grow. We hit a little bump in the road in last year because um, the Wheeled Body Program thought that us putting cadaveric video, videos on, the, on YouTube was uh, a form of posting on social media. And so we've had some, a little setback, but we have a lot of some new enthusiasm that's gonna, inject, I think, infuse a lot of positivity into this. This is uh, William Shirley, who's a, a new hire of the department for, um, uh, uh, to, uh, for video production um, and, and web design. And so he's gonna be really helping us, I think, with both producing content and getting it out in a format that um, uh, will really expand uh, IGOT's impact. Um, Research-wise, uh, you know, this has really been, I think, uh, uh, an area of a lot of um, uh, continued growth for IGOT, um, both our research initiative, which is helping our partner sites uh, build research capacity and address uh, locally relevant research questions. We also have a fellowship for medical students that uh, continues to grow. Um, you know, the last year has been uh, a really productive one. We've uh, completed a number of uh, clinical trials. I think we um, saw a couple of them uh, presented earlier this morning um, and continuing to grow research networks. So we have an established uh, research network of multi for multi-center studies in Latin America, and we're building one with partners from the UK and South Africa uh, and uh, all across Africa as well, uh, and continue to be successful with funding these programs increasingly. I uh, just put this in there as a shout out to uh, Kalechi and Syed, who did a great job presenting two of the trials. I think 
uh, just showing some of the type of work that we're trying to do to generate evidence that influences policy and practice that's locally relevant um, to our partners. Uh, this is just a little plug about our research program for medical students, which um, has continued to, to really grow and expand. I think we had like 30 applications this year. Um, and they've, we have um, the exciting news that one of our recent uh, uh, fellows is going to match as a resident, uh, Michael Flores, and Kelsey Brown, our other fellow, uh, matched at Harvard. So um, we're really happy with that and had two great fellows this past year who I think will be future, future leaders as well. So um, I wanted to not spend too much time so that we have time for the other speakers and time for uh, Q&A and all that and discussion. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize there's a big uh, unmet burden of uh, orthopedics around the world, and it's really disproportionately borne by uh, a lower and lower resource places. And it's not just a trauma thing or just a pediatrics thing. It cuts across all of our specialties. Um, I think partnership has really been a successful model for us to, um, to help address this uh, here at UCSF, and we're excited at, to see the various ways that our programs continue to expand. Um, and it really is driven by uh, a passionate uh, bunch of faculty and trainees uh, and uh, alumni. So thank you all for your support. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we have a, I think we have a first here at the, uh, at the Abbott meeting. Um, we have Dr. Sabatini joining us from Uganda. She's gonna be on Zoom, available for questions. She's pre-recorded her lecture, so we're going to run that next, and she'll be available for answering questions during, during the year. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be with you today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but true to the topic of this session, I am working this month in Uganda, so not able to be there um, in person. Uh, I've been asked to cover forging an academic path through partnership. Um, which is hard to do in, in the small amount of time provided, but we'll do the best that I can. I have no disclosures relevant to the talk, but do always want to show appreciation to those um, who have supported my global work through research grants, which includes POSNA, the department, and the Ruth Jackson. We know that um, the conversation around global surgery really changed in 2015 when the Lancet Commission report Global Surgery 2030 was released because this really brought to the forefront issues of access to surgical care and the significant disparities and inequities that exist, exist in the world. So by billion people lack access to um, safe and affordable surgical care and anesthesia. And if we were to make up for the deficit uh, of additional surgical procedures that were needed in low and middle income countries, we need to do 143 million additional surgical procedures every year. Of those 5 billion, 1.7 billion are children and adolescents, and horrifically less than 3% of pediatric patients in low income countries and less than 8% in low middle income countries have access to surgical care. We know that surgical disease accounts for about 30% of all morbidity and mortality worldwide, um, and that the, the surgical disease burden accounts for, in some estimates, up to four times the annual deaths of HIV, TB, and malaria combined, yet get, get very little funding relative to the infectious disease um, conditions. So the term global surgery for those who are like, where did that come from? It really started to be used over the last 10 years or so um, after the Lancet Commission report and is defined as the study and practice of improving access to timely quality and affordable surgical care for all and has been increasingly integrated in lots of different conversations, including, for example, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We certainly know from the model that has been um, displayed for us here at UCSF by Rick Coughlin, Rich Goslin, and the IGOT crew that training and support of local surgeons is critical for long-term sustainable change if we are to improve access and quality of surgical care globally the way that we need to in order to meet this unmet um, burden of surgical disease over time. And no amount of mission trips, which is what lots of people think about when they hear about global surgery, um, can meet this level of need. Only a well-trained local workforce can do so. And so our work really should be education-driven and capacity-building focused. Um, my own path is a bit of a long one, but I will simply say that um, in 2015, I started going regularly to Uganda to work on a research program and educational activities in the country and felt a bit unfulfilled and, um, and unsuccessful in that work, not being able to spend as much time uh, doing the work as I felt I needed to just by piecemealing some research and vacation time together. So I sat down with Dr. Vale and he... Um, 
sort of shared this vision uh, with me of, of what this could become in terms of a career in academic global surgery and allowed me to reduce down to 50% clinical time um, with 50% of my time spent on global surgery and health equity work. My first trip to the country of Uganda was 2013. Uh, I was teaching in a course with Norgrove Penny, who's pictured there, who lived and worked in the country for a number of years. And for me, this is where I saw injection injuries for the first time. Just as a side note, um, these are um, injections causing iatrogenic injuries, gluteal fibrosis and post-injection paralysis, which lead to orthopedic disability. Um, I love to talk about it, so would happy be happy to if anybody has any questions ever in the future, but this is truly intersectional between public health and orthopedics. And having multiple conversations with people in Uganda at that time, I found that there was a lot of interest in studying these conditions but not a lot of support or infrastructure to do so. So set to help lead a, a research team comprised of orthopedic surgeons, uh, physical therapists, social workers, um, colleagues from the School of Public Health, um, and a research coordinator to put together uh, a whole research team in order to address these conditions as well as others. I have three partner hospitals that I work with here in Uganda, um, two that are upcountry in the area known as Kumi, uh, which is sort of a village-based environment where this is really an epicenter of injection injuries and other untreated uh, pediatric orthopedic conditions. And then Corsu Hospital outside of the capital, which is the one hospital that's focused on orthopedics and plastic surgical care for children. Um, and this team uh, over the years now has worked on a variety of different projects. We have a number of different uh, topics that we address with ongoing research studies. And just in the spirit of academic medicine, publications can come from this work. And these are just a few of the examples of injection injury studies that we've been able to publish over the last few years to really bring to light uh, both these conditions in general, but also their surgical treatment and how to prevent them in the future. Just really quick by way of perspective, uh, there's 40 million people in California with 2,406 orthopedic surgeons, 46 million people in Uganda uh, with only 80 orthopedic surgeons, so 573,125 people per orthopedic surgeon. And we only have two fellowship trained pediatric orthopedic surgeons in the country with a much larger pedi pediatric population than what California has. Um, so significant disparity in terms of access to specialized surgical care. The pillars of my work are really that of an academic surgeon, right? So research, education, advocacy, and patient care. Uh, and I do this with a capacity building lens. So research-wise focus on local problems with local surgeons and healthcare workers as my partners and leaders in some of this work. Um, educationally focused on meeting the needs of people here and what they wanna learn about, what they need to learn about and making sure that it's driven by them with local faculty um, and an emphasis on the future workforce, uh, ideally in pediatric orthopedics. So in trying to get medical students and residents interested in pediatric orthopedics and um, now having a fellowship in the country. And recognizing that with only 80 orthopedic surgeons for 46 million people, the vast majority of the musculoskeletal care is not delivered by orthopedic surgeons. Um, so focusing this education on general surgeons and pediatricians is important as well. Um, and at some point in the future, the bone setter population, which delivers a huge amount of the musculoskeletal care in country. Advocacy is critical with an emphasis on orthopedic and health organizations, our local, regional, and national leadership, as well as the funding organizations, ideally who will um, start to put some funding into global surgical work. And then I do provide patient care while I'm here, but always with local colleagues with bi-directional education as um, the primary goal. Um, just with regards to fellowship, I want to acknowledge Mark Berry and his um, organization, CODEN, who um, I've been working with to have a pediatric fellowship here at Corsu. We currently have three in-country orthopedic surgeons who are training in pediatric orthopedics who will sit for the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa exam in December. Um, and that's, for example, the month that I'm here is teaching in the fellowship for uh, the three fellows. Uh, the hope then is that we will continue fellowship training in the country with our four or a pediatric orthopedic surgeons leading the way, um, and myself and others providing educational and research support um, to help build the future pediatric orthopedic workforce. Um, an acknowledgement of IGOT, of course, who is a true example and leader in um, global surgery and orthopedics specifically with an emphasis in education, research, and advocacy. Um, and we all know that the, the team has done tremendous um, work, um, including the SMART courses, 
the online learning portal, as well as a tremendous array of research um, that really shows the extent um, that you can achieve with an academic global surgical research program. Um, and just, you know, much respect to uh, doctors Morshed, Shear, Coughlin, McLeod, and Saberwall for all the work that they do um, uh, doing collaborative research with our colleagues around the world. And then I do want to acknowledge the UCSF Center for Health Equity and Surgery and Anesthesia, which launched in 2020 as one of um, one of the core centers of the Institute for Global Health Sciences, um, which uh, now has over 300 members and collaborating institutions across all aspects of the perioperative service space, including all the surgical departments, anesthesia and nursing, um, which is really building on the legacy of global surgery work here at UCSF that was started by Haile Day Boss more than 20 years ago. Um, and the goals of CHESA are really to break down the silos that exist between the different surgical subspecialties and surgery with anesthesia, because we are all collectively working towards the same thing, which is to improve access to surgical care and the quality of surgical care globally. So we should be doing that together, not separately. We advocate for balanced implementation and research, um, expanding our long-term partnerships and resource denied communities, and really wanna create new models for academic collaboration based on reciprocity, um, equity, and action with the hope of developing future leaders um, to cure inequity and transform collaboration. Um, this is our leadership group, which includes four associate directors from different surgical and, anesthe and anesthesia uh, backgrounds, as well as our director, Daruk Ozgadiz, who's from pediatric surgery um, and our amazing administrative team. Our leadership team is diverse and large, representing both UCSF surgical subspecialties and anesthesia, as well as nursing and our colleagues from various places around the world. And just wanna highlight our fellowship program, which um, is this current cohort of fellows for this year and our incoming cohort, which is really to train future global surgical leaders includes 26 fellows from 10 countries, 77% of whom are low middle income country based. And two of them, 8% are orthopedic surgeons who are two of my colleagues um, here in Uganda. And when I think about how much this has, this landscape has changed over the last 10 to 15 years, where when I was a resident, global surgery wasn't even terminology that we used. Now there's actually academic global surgery is a real thing. There's an association of academic global surgery. The ACS gives an academic global surgeon award. And there's even a book called Academic Global Surgery, which I should probably read. Um, as we embark upon our paths in this space, it's important to acknowledge that there are multiple challenges to the individual who's trying to do this work. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but this includes certainly funding where there's really no research support for I me, mean, sorry, no salary support and very little right now for research in the global surgical space. It is time away from our domestic clinical practices. So you have to have outstanding and kind um, orthopedic partners who are willing to cover your patients, which I am blessed to have. And I'm very appreciative of my colleagues for that certainly time away from the family. And then there's this whole issue of applicability, right, where some of this is um, work is not really regarded by our own national organizations, journals, and maybe even our institutions at the same level as research from high income countries, because perhaps it's not seen as applicable um, to them. And then there's huge challenges in, in our overall collective success in, in trying to do this work. And that includes inequities and resources between partners um, it includes issues of colonialism and sort of imbalanced power structures, um, cultural differences and the need for cultural humility, particularly for those um, from high income countries. And then lack of incentives for our low income country partners um, who don't have research requirements, for example, in their private practices or in their government hospital positions, uh, but yet really want to do this, um, this work. And so how can we help uh, empower them to, to have the resources and the time to do this? Um, and then certainly politics, pandemics, political instability and war and natural disasters can derail any well laid out uh, research project or educational program. Um, it's important to acknowledge that we do not need to leave the United States in order to do health equity work in surgery. We have plenty of disparities that exist within equity and um, within access and uh, quality here in the United States. But if we're going to do this work, we need to focus on partnerships and collaboration. We want to establish long term commitment to a given place and follow the lead of the local surgeons, the team, the community partners. Um, that we're working with and really listen to what they need and have them guide the work um, they likely know better than we do and focus on the bigger issues of resource needs and education, not service delivery. I wanna thank the great team of people that I get to work with in Uganda. And I'm incredibly thankful for my partners at UCSF 
our, uh, the staff at Oakland Children's who help take care of my patients, both when I'm there and when I'm not. Um, Dr. Vale for his leadership and certainly my colleagues and friends um, from IGOT and Chessa who are wonderful partners and collaborators in this work. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker is going to expand on a key few concepts that you uh, just heard about. Um, uh, Sanjeev Sarwal has dedicated a lot of his, his academic output investigating and exploring how we do bi-directional uh, 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 relationships appropriately. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. And it's, it's a privilege to follow Dave and Colleen. And um, I came into this a little bit uh, differently in terms of my path. I, I grew up uh, in India and then came here after med school. So I thought, I think I, I kind of lived in both worlds. So um, what intrigued me was this whole concept of bi-directionality. And I just put a name to it a few years ago, but I think uh, I was trying to struggle with it for a while. And these are my disclosures. So we all know about the North-South divide and what it means, not just in socioeconomic disparities, but healthcare access, and then you throw in culture and you know, diversity within a country or even a neighborhood. Um, we certainly know that, and now recognize more than before, that this uh, unilateral one-way model doesn't seem to work. Um, so the paradigm has changed, the world's become flatter, and we know that give and take is what it's all about, and actually the givers are winning. So uh, that brings me to the story of chai, which is tea in India. And growing up in India, if you were traveling in public trains, um, there would be these uh, people who would serve tea in these uh, clay cups called kullars. And now when I visit India, they're all plastic cups. So, you know, this is in the name of progress, and obviously, you know, it's a big, huge, uh, you know, footprint on the environment. Um, so bi-directional learning, again, you know, plug for, we do these posi post non bi-directional courses, which is Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, North America. And the typical feedback consistently is that the faculty from North America learn more going to a place like India than vice versa. Um, so, you know, a few of my friends and mentors, sort of this is a very common theme and adage that you've probably heard many times before when you visit, and I think our residents know this pretty well, is when you go there, you want to leave skills and not scars, like was uh, said earlier by Colleen and Dave as well. Uh, so then, you know, it brings us to, well, what is it that we can tangibly learn from our partners in low-middle-income countries? And this is a short list that I came up with you know, creative solutions to complex problems, and we'll show you examples of that. Resource utilization, that's a big thing in our healthcare economy these days. You know, this concept of focus factory, do one thing, but do it well, and do it repeatedly, and that's cost effective and also good for, um, for output and outcomes. Um, learn about natural history of diseases, and it's great for our trainees to understand if you don't, don't drain a septic hip day one, uh, in a kid, you know, what's the outcome? What about malunited fractures in kids and adults? And then also management of resurgent problems like polio and polio-like enteroviruses that's actually come back to North America. And, and just conceptually, and I think we all notice that when we go overseas or we do courses, just the hunger and the sheer sort of reverence for gaining knowledge, I think that just sort of imparts this higher level of energy for the person who's trying to give or share knowledge to say, hey, you know, these people are so receptive. Um, so I want to introduce this concept that some of you may already know. It's called reverse innovation. It means that something that was uh, innovated in a frugal environment out of desperation and need, and then sort of has a trickle-up effect into a higher income country, and then sort of takes off uh, past a tipping point. And so, you know, that's a concept that the Dartmouth uh, socioeconomic uh, educators and economists have sort of popularized. So, you know, I do some limb deformity, so I feel the Elizaroff thing, and I know Kevin Lewis in the audience, he's, he's sort of heard the story many times before, but Gavril Elizaroff was a Russian Jew who was not even an orthopedic surgeon, he was really a family doctor 
who post-World War II was in a small Siberian town of Kurgan. Um, and um, so he was, uh, you know, uh, seeing a lot of patients with malunions, non-unions, and, uh, you know, post-war wounds. And he came up with this concept of um, distraction osteogenesis after some trial and error. And then as the story goes, um, there was Thor Heyerdahl, who was a Scandinavian uh, anthropologist, and he was an, uh, a very inclusive-minded person uh, way back. And he decided to take a trip on a paperous uh, raft from Morocco to Barbados, and he tried to include people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, et cetera, et cetera. And as serendipity would have it, in, on that boat was a Russian doctor whose name was uh, Yuri Senkovich, and a photojournalist from Lecco, Italy, whose name was Carlo Mauri. Turned out Carlo had a malunion, infected malunion of the tibia that was treated multiple times by Italian surgeons but never got fixed. So Carlo tells Senkovich about this, and Senkovich tells him of this guy, uh, Elizarov in Kurgan, Russia. So sure enough, Carlo goes to Kurgan, and here you can see both of them smoking, which is you know not to be replicated. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, Carlo goes back to Lecco, and he's friends with Angelo Villa, who is an orthopedic surgeon and the president of the AO Italy at that time. And so he sort of pushes this. So, you know, if you go back to this whole concept of reverse innovation, so I would think that the Italians were really the early adopters of this uh, technology. And then it takes off when Richard's Medical, which, was, uh, which then ultimately became Smith & Nephew, sponsors a trip for North American surgeons. I don't know if Kevin was part of that. Um, but uh, so they go to Kurgan in 1988 and then come back and that sort of, then I think that really hits the tipping point in a high income country. And then, you know, and so this is, you know, in a small way, it's affected me uh, with uh, thanks to high uh, income country innovators in terms of how my limb deformity practice has changed over the years. So I think, you know, back, and you've seen this earlier from Dr. Schmidt. So, you know, certain principles just don't change. So I think the concept is when you go visit them, and this is a borrowed phrase from, uh, I think, uh, my friend Scott Nelson, when you go here, you improvise, you don't compromise. So I, th I think that's a concept that's really quite uh, intriguing and stimulating when you go there. So I also want to uh, introduce you to this concept of jagar, which is an Indian word, which is now in the Oxford Dictionary. And it talks about, um, you know, doing something, again, when you have limited resources, doing it in a very creative way, very flexible, but you also do it in a way that serves the bottom of the pyramid. So you can see in that little video that how you could sort of MacGyver so many things in so many different ways uh, to create, you know, creative solutions out of uh, little nothings. Um, so how does that relate to orthopedics? I mean, we have these techniques all the time, and you don't have to go to a low middle income country. I mean, this first paper was from a military surgeon in Virginia, where you're using the arm board as a spica cast table to put a spica cast on a kid. Um, last time I went to India, you know, I was really fascinated. They were using the Taylor Spatial Frame, you know, distraction rod, uh, to do sequential stretching of flexion contractures in a cast. So you don't have to keep changing cast, you just keep turning the strut and you keep straightening the knee. Um, you know, instead of doing gro uh, growing rods, you put dual rush rods as expandable devices. And of course, this has been now commercialized, but using cordless drill covers for, you know, um, for sort of uh, Home Depot type uh, uh, drill sets. And then finally, for implants, you know, instead of using the fancier guided growth plates, just cut a two-hole recon plate to do uh, the same thing with gradual deformity correction. You know, in terms of orthotics and prosthetics, <clears throat> I think this was locally relevant. We all know about 
uh, UC Berkeley, and they made a huge contribution in the prosthetic world with the satch foot, solid ankle cushion heel. The problem was that it's not very applicable in the tropics. So um, this uh, surgeon uh, in uh, northern India um, devised this Jaipur foot by taking that solid part of the keel, the midfoot, and then just substituting that with um, a rubber so that that would give you more pronos uh, supination of the foot. And it, it was great for a rugged climate, especially if the population was bare feet. So I think, you know, things like that. And of course, you know, uh, locally made uh, braces for Ponsetti technique now with the application of uh, 3D printing. And of course, we all use CAS and then just split the CAS and use them as CAS braces. So just a few examples. You know, resource utilization. Why do you always have to have these plastic and paper? Why can't we have web roll like a toilet paper and just kind of use what you use and then, you know, leave the rest for the next person? you know, adjustable radiolucent operating tables that work really well, or solar-powered autoclaves for that matter. Uh, you know, this thing, and I know Ellen, who's here in the audience, gonna do a review paper <clears throat> on reusable and refurbished implants. You know, you gotta call the bluff. Why do we have to use tourniquets just once and then just throw them away? It just doesn't make sense. Um, and here's my friend Scott Nelson. So this, you know, talk about South-South partnerships. He took a 24-hour flight from Haiti to New Delhi and then back just to buy cheap implants and then, you know, use them in Haiti. Um, you know, we talked about value, right? So sign nail is a great example of value-based implants where there are no frills, no gimmicks. You do what's needed, but you uh, impact a large portion of the population. Uh, and then finally, this concept of social entrepreneurs are really in the medical field, doctorpreneurs, where, you know, yes, you're doing it for the good of many, but you're also actually, you know, making a profit on that because truly, I mean, that's the way to be sustainable. And I think there's a, this uh, whole concept of, you know, you know, tapping the untapped market because that's where you get the volume. Um, and so an example from the uh, ophthalmologic uh, partners is this whole concept of focus factories. And again, you know, they, they do the same operation, but the doctor just goes from room to room. And, you know, once the patient's prepped, they just take the cataract out. And the non-medical people will do the pre and post-op and the dressings, et cetera. So I think that concept, we already have it here, but I think can be, you know, applied to a deeper level in orthopedics as well. And of course, again, for trainees and surgeons, you know, what happens if you don't take care of patients uh, at an appropriate, timely fashion, and how to do creative solutions with uh, low-cost implants? Uh, and then, you know, how diseases are managed. Just so, um, do I have another couple of minutes? Hmm? Or, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I think I was gonna go over time, so that's why I'm gonna skip this, but this is just a story about polio and enterovirus and how it sort of went full circle. I'm just gonna speed through this, but um, this I went with my mentor to Tajikistan when there was a polio epidemic. Long story short, full circle, there was an enterovirus epidemic, and then, you know, Colleen was part of this project, and, um, you know, it ended up that it sort of was a payback back to the high-income countries. So I think what are the barriers to bidirectional exchange? I think we've talked about it you know, lack of awareness, cognitive biases that we've talked about, you know, establish, establishing fiefdoms, and, you know, sometimes the ego is coming through the back door, so we just have to be aware and recognize that. And how do we get there? I think all the stuff that we've talked about, including the e-learning platforms that, you know, Dave and the department and I got uh, have been pushing, um, and then just, you know, identifying local champions or better still be the local champion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. All right, last but not least, uh, David Atkin, who's a, a, a graduate of this program and an upstanding member of our orthopedic community here, um, both locally and globally, um, has, you know, has really taken on um, IGOT and uh, brought, some, you know, brought some fresh ideas and, 
that are currently underway. He's going to talk to us a little bit about public-private partnerships. Dave. Okay. Well, in the uh, Greek tragedies, the actors would always come in and first beg the forgiveness of the audience, and I will do that. I am actually, my confession is, I'm a recovering New Yorker. So my talk will be laden with opinions. They're just my opinions. At least it's not Friday at 3 p.m. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk a little bit about the concept of public and private partnership. Now, the first of the very numerous painfully obvious things that I'm going to say today is UCSF is a remarkable institution. Um, and for me, when I gained entrance into the residency 35 years ago, I knew that this was a major opportunity for me in my life. Um, as has been said in medicine, medicine is not about knowing the answers. Medicine is about asking the questions. I think the mark of what is truly great about UCSF is its ability to continue to evolve and its desire to grow and its humility to be open to new partnerships and, and new synergistic relationships. To talk about a successful public private relationship, I probably wouldn't have to go any further than this slide. Um, Chris and Jenny McConaughey were some of the most incredible, if not the most incredible people I've ever met and generations of UCSF graduates met with a brief biography. Uh, Chris was an orthopedic surgeon from North Carolina. Jenny, his wife, was a nurse. In 1981, they started African Medical Mission. And in 1984, they moved into the segregated homelands of apartheid South Africa to tackle the orthopedic needs. Chris, as an orthopedic surgeon, had a daunting task of 2.6 to 3 million people with no orthopedic care. Jenny immediately launched into education, HIV care, um, care of um, preschools and teaching. And of the many uh, things that I learned while I was there in South Africa, this was the first. Um, keep your doors of your Rondavel closed. This is my first official visitor at Bedford Center. Um, not everything you learn, you learn in a book. Chris and Jenny taught us without words. Chris and Jenny taught us with the examples of their lives that medicine is a life of service. Now for me, where I was in my life, not only did I not understand that concept, I never even conceived that concept, that this profession that we had, had innumerable rewards waiting for each of us once we dedicated ourselves to service. So what is Operation Rainbow? Operation Rainbow, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We operate on children around the world where that care is not available. Our history, uh, one of the truly great uh, surgeons and people that we've met in our life is uh, Dr. Taylor Smith, who uh, in 1989 started doing uh, missions into Central and South America. And this really became uh, the beginnings uh, of uh, global health rotations or, or visits or trips um, at UCSF. Um, we had a broad participation. You may recognize this guy, uh, Rick Coughlin, who's been a mentor to absolute generations of us. Um, and in the 1990s, we had a, a really broad participation of uh, residents. I, would, I think every resident would say that the experience was powerful. To some of us, the experience was transformative. And 
helped us to shape our careers. Okay. Um, Short-term volunteerism comes um, into broad criticism. And is it worthwhile? Does it help? Um, does it harm? And I think anyone who's read the literature critically understands there are incredible limitations to short-term volunteerism. Um, impact, sustainability, and, and really follow-up. So for some people, they would beg the question whether short-term volunteerism should even exist. This picture is uh, Laura Shapiro on our last mission two months ago um, and creating a research model for implementation science of converging on the standard of care in the patients we treat here in volunteer missions. And for anyone who's worked with the residents at UCSF or with the young faculty, I think every older alumni here is thinking the same thing. Oh my God, I'm so glad I got in when I did, because I would never get in now. <laughs> you, this, uh, it was really amazing to watch um, the implementation of the study. So what did this study do? It's in an, a HIPAA compliant EHR, and it's on an iPad, and so, you institute the same quality measures that you would do here. You do timeouts. You give preoperative antibiotics. You dicta dictate a postoperative note. You do a preop note. You confirm you've got the right patient by photograph. You then have data management, so there's not a duplication of data, but most important, you have follow-up. One of the features of this EHR is that it sends a text that anyone in the village who has a smartphone can take a photo of the child or the limb and download it for free. And they get these texts at three weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, and six months. So it's rudimentary, but it is actually the beginning of follow-up in short-term volunteerism, which I think is incredible. And I want to talk about the potential synergies. You know, universities are powerful. Um, some um, can be proud and, and not open to new ideas. But let's, when we look at Rainbow's relationship with UCSF, let's not forget the difference between efficacy and effectiveness. This is a brilliant model. But how does it work in real, in, in real world setting? And any theoretical model needs to be field tested. So I think that um, from the very beginnings of, of and, and Lauren and I have been working on this for two years, at the very beginnings of meeting each other, we realized that this was going to be a, a really positive relationship for both organizations. Now, this is another example of UCSF I got and, and Operation Rainbow. I think in about 1998, I brought an arthroscopy tower to one of the missions. And suddenly, we had so many host surgeons attend the mission um, because they wanted this skill. The skill was valuable to them. The skill was lucrative to them. And so we found that it really increased the participation of the local surgeons. And again, we are there not to do surgery, but to teach surgery. So this is a paper we wrote with the IGOT fellow last year, looking at the sustainability of arthroscopy in the developing world. And some of this based upon the 25 arthroscopy centers that Rainbow had set up. Now, the importance of this paper to me is, okay, if you want to do qualitative research in an under-resourced setting, what do you need? Well, you need reliable sources. So Rainbow's ability to say, listen, this is Dr. Bing Milano from the Philippines. We have worked with him for 24 years. This is, you know, um, the doctor that we've worked with from Honduras. So to identify people, 
you need objective input and you need trust. The trust is bi-directional. People need to know that someone's not just parachuting in to do research for their own agenda, but indeed they're coming to do research which benefits the population that they're studying. And so uh, this example, uh, being Milano in the background, with the equipment that he was given in 2001, he now comes out twice a year to get new equipment, and they have taught over 200 surgeons in Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, not to mention the video courses that they have produced. Okay, um, training. Training is, uh, is an important aspect, and I think for any program like I got, I think I got and Operation Rainbow share a lot of ideals. One of the things is we're looking for those dynamic individuals who are gonna make a difference, that they're gonna become educators, that if you give them equipment, they don't covet it, they share it and teach with it. So obviously I got has identified numerous of these individuals, but so is Operation Rainbow. So this is, um, let's see if I can use the pointer on this. This is uh, Dr. Hike Avakian, right, in 2001, who came and trained um, at, at San Francisco General Hospital for a year. Um, you guys might recognize this individual Man, they just don't make ponchos like that anymore. <laughs> I digress. <laughs> All right, so this is 2001, working with the Armenian surgeons from Yerevan. This is 2022, working with the Armenian surgeons from Yerevan. Um, and this particularly two years after the war, um, where the hospital that they worked at that was an elective hospital was converted into a trauma center and they estimated that they have three years of backlogged trauma cases from the war. Now, an interesting thing, a lot of people, a lot of people with very good intentions went to Armenia after the war and they talked to the orthopedic companies and said, hey, can you donate me some large frag sets? Can you, can you give me this? We just set up three sign nail sets and those are still functioning after the war. And in fact, these are the candidates for next year and this is their agenda. They're going first for a full week to the sign course. They're then going to the OTA and then they're going for a month of clinical observation with the OTI. You cannot overstate how powerful I got's ability to train surgeons is. It, it is remarkable. And it, it, does, it does make a major impact. And then I think the thing that's different about I got is I got studies its impact. It's one thing to say that, hey, we're making a big impact. It's another thing to do a study and definitively show that you're making impact or not making impact. I mean, that's what studies are truly for. All right, UCSF residents in Operation Rainbow, please take this to all the residents as a formal invitation to participate in our Operation Rainbow missions. Um, as Sanjeev said, bi-directional learning is incredible. It's a good thing to work a little bit out of your comfort zone with appropriate supervision. And the next time that <laughs> if you're on a mission and you feel a little bit overwhelmed, congratulations. You might actually be taking yourself to the limits of what you feel capable of and that's where the growth occurs. So our missions are great for, um, for both, for any of the surgeons in the room. I see Tom Sampson here who's graced many of our missions. And then the residents in the past couple of years, we've been working with different institutions. We, uh, we've taken many residents from this um, institution in uh, Palo Alto, the 
the name escapes me. Um, <laughs> take that as a, as a challenge. Um, so this is our mission. You know, Sunday we'll, we'll see the patients, 300 patients will operate through the days, cast change and pack up. You could go for a minimum of five days. Now, our philosophy, we are not trying to be a big organization. Taylor Smith said definitively, you know, we want to do good work. We don't want to harm anybody. So, you know, our surgeons are largely based from a combination of Stanford, UCSF, Johns Hopkins, and we have some other Bay Area teams and, and a Texas team as well. Our philosophy is simply to leave people better than we found them. And I think now with the brilliant work that Lauren Shapiro and, Ra and Robin Kamal from Stanford are doing to possibly improve short-term volunteerism to make sure it helps and doesn't harm. All right, I'm going to wax philosophical. Sorry about that. Distillation, the process of purification. What would it take to distill medicine? Well, let's get rid of the transfer of money. Let's get rid of the egotism. Let's get rid of the distrust that doctors have for patients and patients have for doctors. On a mission, let's get rid of bureaucracy. Let's get rid of unnecessary documentation. So what's left? Compassion and hard work, which is exactly what all of us signed up for. So I can't tell you that my career is perfect, but when I'm on an Operation Rainbow mission, my career is perfect. And I would hope that anyone who's interested in participating would please uh, get a hold of me and uh, take this as a formal invitation. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Um, I know we're over time, um, but I, I know that you must have burning comments or questions um, uh, before we close. Anyway, Dr. Wilson. Thank you so much. Um, you know, some of us just aren't in a place in our life or maybe in our career to spend time in other countries. And I was hoping maybe you could tell all of us that are interested in supporting the mission, how can we do that um, and, and not take these trips, taking you know, weeks away from our family, if that's not the right time for us in where we are in life. And you know, us, maybe just being me, but <laughs> I would love to learn more about what we can do here. Yeah, I, I wonder if any of the panelists would like to take that on. I mean, we've got several kind of generations represented here in, di in different practice models. Sanjeev, do you want to say something? So since we've not talked about global health, I just wanted to put a plug for that. And I think that's a huge way all of us can contribute. Um, so I think UCSF, thanks to Dr. Bale and Dr. Sabatini uh, and others, you know, um, was, uh, it's, it is a pediatric, uh, surgery, uh, free access, oh, it's not working. Thank you. I don't know if you heard, I'm not going to repeat myself, but global health. Um, so um, it's really pediatric, uh, uh, orthopedic, and surgical subspecialties, but I think um, the extension of that is the IGOT portal. And I think we can, like, just like uh, Dave Scheer said, you know, we've got other subspecialties that are so relevant and so underrepresented uh, over. So, you know, doing short YouTube videos on surgical techniques, that's actually what people like the most. Just like we have View Medi here, you know, free access, just how to pin a supracondylar, how to pin a hip fracture, you know, and now we've got our new addition um, in our, you know, is it Will, William? The, yeah, so, you know, he can help us and help you uh, do short videos in the operating room, saw bones, and I think that's a great way to contribute, right? Anything? Yeah. We're gonna let Dr. Sabatini say something just so she can prove that she's actually live. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, good morning from here. 
Um, I appreciate that question very much, Dr. Westrack. Um, and I want to echo what Dr. Sabrawal said, where contributions of educational content to global help and the IGOT portal um, would be very impactful. I think some of what you do already, like for example, when I have a case here in Uganda that is tumoresque and I don't know what to do with it and I send you the images and the story um, on behalf of my colleagues here because we don't have orthopedic oncologists in country, um, being a resource from San Francisco to our colleagues in various countries where they don't have orthopedic oncology services is critical because you can um, give really critical advice, really impactful advice um, from your house or from your office or from wherever you are. And I would not underestimate the importance of that. I think many of us, um, you know, in San Francisco can, in addition to being a clinical resource, um, can be a mentor when it comes to um, research and research project development um, and, you know, making yourself available to that. And also just leadership um, guidance and mentorship like we do for our own trainees and junior partners. Um, we have many colleagues around the world who might be one of only a few orthopedic surgeons in their country um, and being a resource for them. So th I think there's actually a lot that people can do that's very capacity building oriented and doesn't involve leaving your own children and traveling around the world. And I would encourage everybody to you know, reach out to any of us who no doubt have contacts in various places who would love to be connected with amazing folks like our faculty. Thanks, Colin. Dave, do you want to say something? Maybe any, anything to add? Oh, one comment. Um, so uh, for Rosie, you know, this time of your life, it may not be able to do it, but when the kids get older, take them along. It's impactful. A lot of the kids that came on our missions are now doctors. But one thing I want to tell you about um, that you don't think about where you can be impactful, a nurse is going to give you an implant or something, and they say, Dr. Westrick, we can't use it. It's out of date. First thing I think is, Save it for a rainbow, save it for IGOT. I can't tell you how much equipment that is outdated, drugs that are outdated, I put in a big pile, and <coughs> excuse me, Mark gets, picks it up and takes it to, to rainbow, and we take it with us. Yeah, Sam, can, can you or any of your panel elaborate a little bit on the, on the program for the surgeons from elsewhere coming here, and what, what role this community can play in supporting that in any way, whether it's education or housing or any any aspect of it? Absolutely. Dave, do you want to say something now? Yeah, we, um, <clears throat> I mean, we have some funds to support visiting observerships. I, I don't have the exact number right now, but basically I think if, if you have somebody who you think would, but we're kind of prioritizing our partner sites, we're prioritizing the residents. Like we want to, as I had mentioned in my talk, have a one-to-one -one exchange with our residents going abroad. So those are kind of get the first slots, and then other partners who we might prioritize for you know, various strategic reasons would get priority. But if there's somebody that you know, um, you know, you think would be a, a benefit from uh, from visiting, then um, let us know, and we have a process for kind of deciding, you know, who we can allocate funds to. So um, it's not unlimited, obviously, but it's something that I think is. Um, Really valuable. I was thinking more on this side. You have the structure, you have the support for the people when they come here. Do you need help with that? Ah, uh, yeah, um, absolutely. I think. Um, generally, they've been their clinical observerships. A lot of them have been based predominantly at the OTI, um, but I think. Um, be, we need to do a better job probably expanding that to other sites and other specialties. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, we don't have a, necessarily a formal process for. Like I said, most of them are doing trauma observerships. But again, if you know of somebody or, I think that's the big thing is if we get people who have an interest in other specialties, just trying to make sure that we provide them the opportunity to do observerships at UCSF or Mission Bay or, you know, Cho, wherever it makes sense for them to get the type of experience that they're looking for. Rick, do you want to say something? Is that why you're walking up here? Uh, we, we did have an idea a few years ago before real estate just went you know, bonkers to, to open up a I got hotel in the mission somewhere, but maybe that's what you're getting at. Now that your kids have kind of moved out of the house. 
Yeah, thank, no, thanks for um, this opportunity. And, and um, specifically for Rosie, uh, I want to tie it all together. I'm going to tie JOJ, Rich O'Donnell, uh, Rosie Westrack, and, and the future of oncological management in, in the world. And it sits for us to get together all that stuff that's sitting somewhere that we can put it together in a meaningful way and then distribute it to all practitioners in the world. So it, it's there for us. We don't, I don't have to leave or you don't have to leave, but I think organizing it, there's definitely lots of stuff that we can do. The, the, the real beauty is we all have passion for education. So that's what, that we're all collective. No, no problem talking about that. It's just, how, you know, how do we harness it? And, and my hope from, and it's been our hope, Dave and Sam, as we, we kind of mature in this process of IGOT is it is all of the department. I, I know the, Eric Hansen, I know you, I know, I know we have the educators, we have people that are experienced that understand it deeply and, and want to be involved. So the more we get the whole department involvement in, in whatever way you can, I think ultimately will make us stronger. It's, it's uh, again, um, trying to roll it all together, having, you know, and I'm at the stage where I'm reflective, you know, having Dave and the work he's done, Dave Atkinson, and, and, and that was kind of the whole thing, the public-private partnership kind of model. We're just open for lots of ideas. We have lots of smart people in this room, and, and, and most of us get along pretty well uh, outside of some of the politics, uh, more my own. Um, but... Um, uh, you know, I, that's really, I guess, my plea. And, and uh, as we as we move forward, that is, it, it maybe is not just seen as a trauma centric or seen as an OTI centric Mother Teresa activity that goes on. No, this is a, this is hardcore academics that we're trying to do, and ultimately, that's the power. That's where the power lies. So. I was just going to add. It kind of reminded me that. Putting the two questions together a different way, um, just that uh, the biggest cost we face in hosting people from other places is just the cost of San Francisco housing. So, <laughs> um, a great way, um, Rosie, if you you know, or anyone who wants to contribute, would really would be if we could find ways to, to host. Just hold it close. All right, sorry, um, I'm having a struggle with microphones today. But um, but I'm just going to say that really is our biggest cost because like a month observership, you can imagine that the prices that it is to stay in San Francisco for a day, you do a month, and the, the costs add up really quick. It's what it dwarfs the flight cost. So um, perhaps you know the solution might be for people that want to contribute hosting a visiting resident or a surgeon for um, a week. That could really be powerful if everybody could. You know, spare our bedroom for a week. Uh, it could really go a long way and expand our capacity to host a lot more people at once. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, just going to briefly, I, I think we all know there are organizations, you know, uh, ODA, POSNA, I think arthroplasty probably too. And I know Foot and Ankle does. Like, they have these clinical observerships for visiting scholars with budget attached to it. And they sometimes are looking for both sites. So, I think if we haven't done it, you know, for the subspecialties, we could put our name in. And so that's integrated. And back to Dr. Bale's question, I think we've been struggling a little bit post-COVID with lifting all the visitor restrictions. And actually, Colleen's uh, started a conversation with, uh, you know, Oakland Children's uh, leadership to see if we could get around it. So I think that's not a lost. I think we could talk here for a long time. And it clearly, it, this is a topic of interest to a whole lot of you. I don't think I've seen this many people at 3.50 at a, at a meeting in a long time. So very exciting, but we're gonna have to call it there. I'm gonna turn it back to our, our program chairs and president um, to give us some final parting words. Thanks everybody for your attention.